Today we're going to work with linear equations and functions. So the first thing we're going to do is work with what we call graphical representations of these functions. So the first thing we, you may be familiar with already is, is the coordinate plane. The coordinate plane is used to plot points and create graphs for what we call two variable equations. So remember in unit one, we were just solving for X. Two variable equations we're going to have now, usually it's going to be X and Y. And since we have two variables, what this creates is the ability to graph in what's called a coordinate plane. So to break down the coordinate plane, you know, there's going to be these four quadrants. So the upper right is called quadrant one. The upper left is going to be considered quadrant two. The lower left is going to be this region here. This is going to be quadrant three. And then the lower right side, right lower side, this is going to be quadrant four. The origin is the starting position. So when plotting points, the origin is kind of where we uh, have some stuff going on here. So, so the origin is something else we want to kind of pay attention to. Um, and we kind of see that the origin is located, it's located at this spot right here. So that's when we're plotting points, we start at the origin. Uh, when plotting points, like I said, we're going to be using a capital letter for uh, locating points on the coordinate plane. So in our problem here, they want us to identify the location of point A. To, to locate the location of point A, again, we start at the origin and we move along the x-axis to figure out how far we moved along the x-axis. And notice that the four would be how far we moved to the right. And then we move up two spots along the y-axis, along the y-direction, and we get to point A. So the order pair for point A would be described as four, two. So again, in an ordered pair, you use parentheses and the x-coordinate is first comma. Then you put the second coordinate, which is the y-coordinate second, and you do a close parenthesis. So you, you must use parentheses in uh, creating an ordered pair. So point B, notice how point B is out here in the second quadrant. Notice in the second quadrant, the X value has got to be negative and the Y value has got to be positive. So I'm moving to the left, three, and then I'm moving right, four. So I'm moving up four. So the order pair for point B would be negative three, positive four. So if I look at point C, again, starting at the origin, starting at the origin, we have, we've, we're moving to the left, looks like just one spot, and then we're moving down four. So notice that in the third quadrant, both order pairs are negative. So when we identify point C, we're seeing that that's gonna be a negative one, negative four would be that order pair that locates point C. Point D, if you wanna take a positive video for a second and see if you can just do these on your own, and see if they match up. So point D, we're seeing it's gonna be three, negative six. So positive three, negative six. S would be zero, seven. T would be negative five, zero. W, would be zero, negative two. Z would be um, three, zero. And L would be, be the origin, which would just be zero, zero. So notice that like points S, T, W, and Z, these order pairs here. S, notice how it's not in a quadrant, it's actually on what we call the y-axis. And when you are on the y-axis, notice that your x-coordinate is zero. And notice that point T is on the x-axis. And note that if you're on the x-axis and see how there's two points on the x-axis, T and Z, if you look at T and Z, note that both of those, the y values are zero. So it's gonna be important to us as we move forward. So as we were saying, x-axis points, the order pairs for the, uh, 
So the order pairs for the y's will um, will always be zero. So if if the if there's a point on the x-axis, the y value will always be zero for that. If we're on the y-axis, the order pair's x value is going to always equal zero as well. So it's going to hold true every time. So when we get into two variable equations, a lot of times a two variable equation is commonly called a, a function. So we have that kind of going on here, this thing called a function. So a function exists when what we, what we have is what we call input values. A lot of times X is denoted as the input value. The input value has to go through a series of calculations. So have the series of calculations. And then we get an answer. This result is referred to as the output value or what we call Y. So the first type of function we're gonna deal with is what's called a linear function. A linear function is described as a first degree function. In other words, the exponent of the X is a one. So remember, if the exponent is one, we don't show it, but it's understood to be there. So if, if the variable X has an exponent of one, and we're talking about a two variable equation, this is called a linear function. So degree would actually be um, with a G in there too, first degree function. Um, now, so y equals mx plus b is the equation that represents a linear function. Now, instead of using y, sometimes f of x is used, and this is called function notation. So function notation is when we're involving uh, f of x is going to be our, considered our, our function notation. So if I, if I want to rewrite the following linear equation using function notation, what we're doing is we're just changing the y to f of x. And this is called function notation. f of x equals then this 5x minus 7. So if I have 2y equals 8x minus 10, before I can write in function notation, the y value has got to be isolated by itself. So in other words, we have to solve for y. So if we divide each side by 2, this is going to isolate the y by itself because we know these twos are going to divide out our coefficient becomes a one. So this means our y is by itself. And then we have to divide each term in the numerator by the two. So if we want to separate that as two separate fractions, we can. And we just simplify each one of those fractions. So eight divided by two becomes then this four X. And then 10 divided by two is going to be five. So it's going to be then four X minus five. So as far as function notation goes, we have then F of X equals then this four X minus this five becomes our, our function notation. So the next thing we get into is what we call function tables. So when working with functions, a table is used to organize the solutions, which will be represented by what we call ordered pairs. In these directions, we wanna find five solutions for the following functions. So typically, we like to have y by itself because it's easier to create the table. So if I have like y equals three x minus one, what I can do is substitute each one of these values of x in for four x and solve for y, and I can find the, the corresponding y value. So here I would have y equals three times negative two minus one. So if I can do that math, three times negative two would be negative six minus one. We see that we do get a negative seven. So negative two, negative seven, that would be considered our, our solution. Also, that could be expressed as an order pair, negative two, negative seven. Let's substitute negative one in. We have y equals three times negative one. Oops, don't need a negative one there just yet. So if I'm gonna substitute negative one in for x, if you will. So I have y equals three times negative one minus one. And notice how we get negative three minus one, which is going to now be um, a negative four. So we have that. Now, one of the things about linear functions is if I make the x's change in a, in a consistent way, so that's how the x's are increasing by one each time. They're increasing by one. 
increasing by one. What I can pick up on is the y values have to have a constant change as well. So notice how the y values here are increasing by three. So if I want to take a shortcut, I can actually just simply add three to that negative four, and that's going to give me my next y value, which would be a, a negative one. I can also double check myself by substituting zero in for x to see if I really did that correctly. So three times zero minus one would give me zero minus one, which would be a negative one. So that does check out. If I add again a three to the negative one, that's gonna give me a positive two. Or again, if I could substitute two in, or I could substitute one in for X and do the math. So I would equal three times one minus one, three minus one would give me two. So that's how there's two ways to do it. I can actually see a pattern in the table and do it that way as well. So if I add three again, that would give me my, my next Y value, which would have been five. And then I wouldn't really necessarily have to go uh, three times two minus one, which would have been six minus one, which would have gave me five. So I, I can do the solutions either way. So if I can see the pattern in the table, I can take advantage of the table. If not, I can do my basic calculations because that's what a function is. The X's have to go through a series of calculations and they end up getting us our, our output value. So again, notice how the negative two is our input value. The negative seven is our output value. And the negative two is what's going through the calculations. In this case, I'm multiplying the X by three, and then I'm subtracting a one. And that gives us those, those values there. So let me clean this up a little bit here. That was a little more erased than I thought. So we'll get there. All righty. Still not used to my eraser. So notice how we had these order pairs, um, negative two, negative seven, negative one, negative four. We had zero, negative one. We had one, two, and we had um, two, five were our, our solutions to that uh, equation. Now, again, there are many, many, many solutions. We just identified five solutions of all of them. So again, there's infinitely many solutions here to do. So if I want to complete the table over here, a good idea is to actually get the y by itself. It makes the math go a little bit easier, a little quicker. So again, I would have to subtract um, a six x on both sides to get the x term out of the way. And note that when you move a, a term to the other side of the equation, all it really changes is its sign. So the six x and negative six x will zero out. The negative two y stays put. And then we have a negative six x plus eight, since those aren't like terms, they both just come down. I just like to bring the linear term down first and then the constant will stay second. So usually kind of do it that way. And then to um, complete it, I have to divide each side by negative two to finish this math off. So if I do that, we end up with Y and then we have to kind of break this apart as negative six over negative two and plus this eight over this negative two. So we end up with, um, negative six divided by negative two would be actually a three X. So we have to reduce that. And eight divided by negative two would be a, a negative four. So that would be our new function. So if we can do this mentally, what I'm doing is I'm gonna multiply three times negative two and do that math here. And I can complete that chart that way. Another thing you can do is if you wanna use your calculator, we can actually use our calculator. So let me see if I can pause the setting here and get my calculator. So functions, we also can use our calculator because we have a, a y equals button on our calculator. If we have y equals, I can type in the function. I, I get the three. The x is right next to the alpha button. So I hit the x there. And then I have minus four. That's going to be my function. If I want to complete the table, if I hit the, right above graph, there's table. Notice how the table is in blue. That means I have to hit the second button first. If I hit the graph button, it'll do the table above it. And also how it'll actually create my table. Notice my x value started at negative two. So I have to scroll up a little bit. And there's my negative two. And negative two would be negative 10. Negative one would be negative seven. So if I can kind of clean that up a little bit there, I can kind of pick those off one at a time. So I have a negative 10. Oops. Get my eraser out there. Okay. So we would have then 
negative 10 for my y value, for, and then negative one, negative seven, zero would have been negative four, and one would have been negative one, and two would have been two. So I'd also complete the table by using the, um, the graphing calculator. So if you look at this next example, I have um, y equals one half x plus three. Again, um, to do five solutions, I have to think a little bit more smartly here because now I've got this denominator over two. So if we have fractions, we have to pick numbers that are divisible by two. So um, numbers that are divisible by two, um, zero works for everything, but then I have to have even numbers after that. So what I could do is choose like negative four, negative two, zero, two, and four for those values, since those all those numbers can be divided by two. So since we have a two in the denominator, that means we're about to divide by two. So if I do my math here, we're gonna have um, y equals, I'm gonna have this one half, this one half times um, a negative four. So I have this one half times this negative four, then I would be adding three to that. And we end up with this, you know, two would go into negative four, negative two, negative two times one would be um, negative two. I'd have negative two plus three, that would equal then um, a positive one. So when I have negative four, I would end up with a one as an answer. If I choose negative two, I have um, y equals um, one half times negative two plus three, Notice how two goes into negative one, two goes into negative two, negative one. One times negative one would be negative one. Negative one plus three would be then two. So when I picked X to be negative two, my Y value was gonna be two. So to pick up on as a pattern here, if we don't wanna do the rest of this is, notice how the X's are going up by two each time. So this is called our rate of change. So if you make a pattern in the X's, then you can create a pattern with your, your Y's. So notice that my Y's are now changing by a one each time. So if I add a one to the two, that's gonna create a three. If I add a one to the three, that's gonna create a four. If I add a one to the four, that gives me a five. So that would be my order pairs there, would be um, negative four, one, negative two, two, zero, three, two, four, and four, five. So again, if I wanted to, I could do that on a graphing calculator. So I have y equals, and if I clear that off, to do one half, I usually like to put that in parentheses. So one divided by two, close parentheses, x, and then um, we had plus three. What was that there? Plus three. So if I hit the table, so if I go up to negative four, so negative four was one. Notice I didn't choose negative three because it created a decimal and I was looking for whole numbers. It makes the math easier to see. So negative two was two. Um, notice that zero was the next point that I chose because it wasn't going to be a decimal. Zero, three, two, four, and then four, five. So notice how that does match our table using our, our graphing calculator. But if, if I was going to do some graphing, you know, I really want to choose whole numbers at first before I get into any kind of decimal math. So that's how we have a three in the bottom this time. So I want to pick some numbers that are divisible by three. So this time I'd probably choose like a negative six, a negative three, a zero, a three, and a six, since all those numbers can be divisible by three. So if I want to now do that math, I have y equals negative two thirds times negative six plus five. So I said three does go into negative six, negative two. Negative two times negative two would be a positive four and four plus five would be actually a, a nine. So if I choose a negative three, I'm gonna have y equals um, negative two thirds times a negative three. Well, three is gonna to go to negative three, be a negative one. Oops, I had five there too. So three goes to negative three, it'll be negative one. Negative one times negative two is gonna be a positive two. Two plus five is gonna actually be then a seven. 
So from here, notice that I do have this rate of change that I was talking about. Notice how this is increasing by a three. This is increasing by a three. And this is increasing by a three. And this is increasing by a three. With linear functions, the y's have to hold this same kind of pattern. They have to have this constant change. So notice how these are decreasing by two. So if I decrease by two again, I'm gonna get a five. If I decrease by two again, I'm gonna get a three. If I decrease by two again, I'm gonna get a one. So that would be my, my solutions for that graph using the pattern of, of, a, of this change in the y's and that change in the x's. So if I wanna graph the functions using the table, all you really gotta do is graph the order pairs. So notice I have a, a negative two, negative seven, a negative one, negative four. What I can do is graph those two points. So negative two, negative seven, negative one, negative four, so we have negative, negative seven, does that fit? Yeah. We had um, negative one, negative four. I think we had a zero, negative one. So that's probably enough points. I don't have to graph them all, but if I do, what do we have here? One, two, and two, five. One, two, and two, five. Like I said, the nice thing about a linear function is it makes a, they can all be connected by a line. So if I can find my little line. So what I can do now is I can actually try to align the line with the points and it does cross through those points. So that's why it's called a linear function because the graph of it is actually gonna be a line. So if I want to graph y equals negative 2 thirds plus x plus 5, that's going to be this negative 6, negative 9. Well, that's actually off my graph. So negative 3, 7, I can graph that one. So negative 3, 7 would be here. We also had um, 0, 5, 0, 5. And then we also had... Um, Three, three. We have this kind of going on here. Notice also, if you look at the equation y equals negative two thirds x plus five, notice how this five represents a special spot on the graph. It's going to be this spot here. So when I draw this line, oops. Come up there. So when I draw this line. That's not really good. Try a better job of that. What's going on here? Yeah, it's much better. So it's that when I draw my line, this line passes through the point on the y-axis. This, this point here is called the y-intercept. Notice that if you look at the order pair in our table, you know, we had this order pair, um, zero, five was in our table as well. That's notice how the x is zero. That means we're on the y-axis, so that's our y-intercept. Something else to pick up on is notice how the negative two-thirds is here. Notice how we have what we call this rate of change. A lot of times, this rate of change is written as the, the change in y over the, the change in x. So notice how the top number tells me how my y's are changing and my bottom numbers tells me how my x's are changing. So this is also denoted as like rise over run as a pattern, this ratio. So from my water set, notice that my graph does go down two and right three, down two and right three, it gets on the graph. But notice that you can also go the other direction. Instead of saying negative two thirds, you also could flip the negative and make the, pop, the, the numerator positive and the denominator negative. So you also could have said, 
I could rise up to and I could run to the left three. And that's how I'm still on the graph. So that's how that, that's kind of an interesting pattern that we pick up on as well from the graph. So our next topic is determine if the, if the given order pair is a solution to the equation 2x minus 5y equals 9. To be in a solution to the equation, the x and y values, when they're substituted in, they have to give us a true statement. So to verify that these are solutions, dot, all we have to do is just substitute those numbers in for x and y. So this becomes then 2 times 4 minus 5 times 5. That's got to equal 9. So this would be 8 minus 25. 8 minus 25, that's like a negative 17. So this would be not a solution since it's not a true statement. So if I should use 4.5, so it's going to be 2 times 4.5 minus 5 times 0. Does that equal 9? Well, 4.5 and 4.5 would be actually 9 minus 0. Does that equal, this is supposed to be a 9 over here. Does that equal 9? Well, 9 minus 0 is 9. So yes, this is a solution. So I try the seven and the one. So this would be two times seven minus five times one. Does that equal nine? Well, that's going to be 14 take away five. Does that equal nine? Well, yeah, nine does equal nine. So seven one is also a solution, which means it's going to be, if I graphed it, it would be on the actual line that I graphed. So yes, seven one is a solution. So the next thing we get into is what's called horizontal line and vertical lines. So horizontal lines and vertical lines. So if I have to graph x equals 2, what this is saying is, as far as the table goes, your x's are locked in. So your x's have to be 2. So all i got to do is put like three order pairs of 2's. The y value is not restricted here. So the x, the, the y value can be anything. So to keep it easy, I'm just going to use 0, 1, and 2 for my y values. So if you have an equation x equals 2, what it means is the x values are locked in and the y values are not. So I get to choose my y values, but I can't choose my x's. So that would be 2, 0, 2, 1, and 2, 2. And notice that when I draw the line through those points, this line goes up and down. So this will be described as a, um, as a vertical line. So the equation x equals is going to represent a vertical line. So if I have the equation y equals negative 3, so here if I make a table, what this is saying is y must equal negative 3. So I can't change the y values, but the x values can be whatever they want. So again, I'm just going to use 0, 1, and 2 for the y values. So if I graph those order pairs, um, 0, negative 3, 1, negative 3, 2, negative 3, notice how we do end up with um, a line. But this line is actually going from left to right, which we call a horizontal line, like the horizon. So the horizon horizontal. So a vertical jump, which you may have heard that, vertical kind of means up and down. And so this would be an example of a um, horizontal line. So if the equation only involves y, the line's gonna be horizontal. If the equation only involves x, it's gonna be vertical. So those will be some examples to kind of pick up on. So solving by using a two variable equation. So Coach Barton paid $15,000 for an automobile. The purchase price included a three-year extended warranty, three extended warranty payments of $400 each. How much did the car cost without the extended warranty? So let's C equal the cost of the car and W is the cost of the warranty. So in this problem, 
what we pick up on is, if I, I'm trying to keep it in English first, is we have um, the cost of the car plus we have um, three warranty payments, extended warranty payments. And when it's all said and done, that's going to be my total cost, which they said was $15,000. So the cost of the car, we don't know, but they say, let's C be the cost of the car. That's going to be C then. And then we have three times the warranty payments, which they're saying the W is going to be the warranty payments. So I have three W and that's that equal $1,500. So that becomes a two variable equation. Now they actually tell us though, how much each warranty payment is. So I could rewrite this as C plus then three times 400, that's got to equal then this 1500. So now I can clean this problem up and say, what's this, this then uh, 1200 equals then, actually this is 15,000. I thought that was a little cheap for a car. So we have to subtract in this um, 12,000, I'm sorry, 1200. We're gonna subtract 1200 from the 15,000. So 15,000 take away 1,000 would be 14,000. Take away another 200, then would be uh, 13,800. So the cost of the car would just be $13,800. So that's how we could kind of do that problem is we can set up an actual two variable equation and then solve it. Now, again, we wouldn't necessarily need, need an equation to answer this question, but we're just trying to follow the guidelines because later on, it may be important to set up equations for more, more complicated questions. So that concludes my first lesson on working with linear equations.